Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Audible. In the comment sections of my video on Narnia and Aragon, one request kept coming up over and over again. Make a video about Percy Jackson. That seemed like a good idea, but there was one problem. I had never read a single Percy Jackson book or seen either of the films. Like, I remember it being around, sure, but by the time the book was really popular, I think I had mostly moved on from YA adventure and was busy reading, like, Stephen King. But the Percy Jackson mentions just kept coming in. So I thought, why not? I should at least check out what about this movie upsets everyone so much. So I listened to the first book, The Lightning Thief, and watched the film. And after taking in both, it was very easy to see what everyone was talking about. I mean, really, how did they screw this up so bad? That's what I'm going to be digging into this week. Oh, and if you enjoy this video and want me to cover the second book and movie, definitely leave a comment down below because I think that's something I'd actually be interested in doing. So my experience with the book was kind of interesting. Honestly, at first I wasn't super into it. I'm well outside the target demographic here and I've experienced the chosen one on an adventure narrative about a million times. It's a book that is working with some very familiar tools, but over time I did come to really appreciate it. It's a kid's adventure story executed really well, with likable characters, surprisingly well written action scenes, a clever sense of humor, and a pretty interesting, not always flattering take on the Greek gods that turned out to be more nuanced than what I was expecting. By the time the gang was heading into the underworld, I was pretty fully on board with it. And honestly, the more I experienced of it, the more I actually talked myself into thinking that the movie version couldn't possibly be that bad. I mean, Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief is a book that, as far as adaptations go, should not be the hardest thing in the world. We're not talking about a Richard Yates novel here, where there's tons of internal dialogue that would be hard to put on screen. Or even Narnia, which seems much more difficult to translate faithfully. Percy Jackson is an exciting, fast-paced adventure story that should lend itself to a big screen version fairly easily. And getting through the book, I found myself thinking, look, no matter how bad the movie is, at least they have this great battle with Percy and Ares to fall back on. A chapter that basically seemed tailor-made to be incredible on film. I understand that making any movie is difficult, but come on. By the standards of adapting a book, Percy Jackson should have been a layup. Everything it does well is very translatable to a film, but somehow, Fox found a way to screw it up. Really, really badly. And Theater Mania calls it mesmerizing. This one is worthy of the gods. The Lightning Thief, the Percy Jackson musical. In a series of emails that author Rick Riordan has posted on his website that he sent to the studio while the film was still in production, he wrote, when I first read the script, I admit that I was plunged into despair at just how bad it was. If I were intentionally trying to sabotage this project, I doubt I could have done a better job than this script. And watching the final project, it's easy to see why. I guess we'll start with the elephant in the room and the thing that's brought up the most often when criticizing the film, the choice to age up the characters. Very early on in the process, director Chris Columbus decided that having a middle schooler swing a sword would look too unbelievable on screen. Columbus, who also directed the first two Harry Potter films, has said that he wanted to give the film a very different feel than his Potter experience, and having the characters be 16 or 17 instead of 12 was apparently a big part of that. Now I understand that the guy was probably just sick of working with kids by this point, but this choice had pretty big ramifications that he just didn't seem to care about. It makes all the characters' actions and choices play very differently, and it doesn't help that these versions of the characters actually seem dumber and less mature than their middle school book counterparts. Percy, played by Logan Lerman here, has none of the rebellious anger or sense of humor that we know from the book. Lerman is fine, but the character has kind of been reduced to a blank slate, especially after the first act. Grover has been radically overhauled, doing away with his shyness and insecurity. It's kind of a weird choice, but what's weirder is they don't replace it with anything. Like the Grover of the book has a very simple character arc that would have added a lot to the film. 
he had already screwed up once and feels like he has to prove himself in the eyes of the gods and other satyrs who kind of view him as a joke. He has a whole little subplot that pays off at the end. It works. It's not super complex stuff, but it's very solid characterization. They don't give him any of that here. He's just the horny best friend. Which is too bad because I think of the leads, Brandon T. Jackson is actually giving the most engaging performance. Then there's Alexandra Daddario as Annabeth. Apparently when this came out, fans were furious that she wasn't blonde like she is in the novel. I don't really care about stuff like that in general, but I don't think what's here is a good performance. And right away, the movie seems to dumb down the character. Whereas in the book, during the camp game of Capture the Flag, she strategically tricks Percy into acting as bait, here she's on the opposing team and just waits until the very last second to jump out at him for a simple fight. It's not a huge change, but it does manage to take the character from a smart, strategic daughter of Athena to just someone who's good with a sword, which is something the rest of the movie hardly even uses anyway. I also don't think her and Lerman have much chemistry together. They try to shoehorn in a romance which hasn't at all developed in the first book, and I think it falls pretty flat. The actress has gone on to a really solid career, but this character was not the best start. But it's not just the core trio who have been gutted. Pretty much everything here has been made a bit more bland or uninteresting. Take the kids' relationships with the gods. In the novel, there's actually a pretty good case to be made that Luke has a decent point about how awful they are. In the movie, it's made really clear that the Olympians aren't allowed to speak to their demigod children. In the book, it feels much more like they just don't really feel like it. They're like these distant entities, always discussed but rarely seen, and Percy especially has a conflicted relationship with them. The movie manages to make most of them feel like boring office administrators, instead of being these far away distant gods. I mean the movie actually starts with Zeus and Poseidon arguing on a rooftop while just dressed like normal guys who shop at Brooks Brothers. Like, later we see them giant and in traditional Greek attire, but they never feel awe-inspiring. They kind of look more laughable than anything. You never get the sense that human beings would be fearful in their presence, something the book does really well. And what they do to Hades… I mean, what can you say? I love Steve Coogan, the guy is a really funny actor, and at least when he's on screen the movie has a pulse and doesn't just feel like it's going through the motions, but the character in the book was already funny. They go to the underworld and find that Hades isn't plotting or scheming for more power. He doesn't want more power. He complains about the logistics of running the underworld and how there's way too many souls down there as it is. His speeches are a lot of fun while still feeling like a big threat to our heroes who have to do a lot of quick thinking on their feet. Here, he's basically a sight gag going with this washed up rock star take on the character that robs him of having an interesting perspective on the other gods. He's just petty, vain, and wants power. Something the book did well is making you assume that was his motivation before revealing he's actually just a fed up mayor of the underworld who is tired of being ignored and disrespected. But the change to Hades isn't even the biggest issue with this scene. It's that his wife Persephone is the one who solves the gang's problems, bailing them out at the last minute. For a film that insisted on aging the characters up, it treats them more like dumb kids than the book ever did. What's extra frustrating is if they thought the gods felt too samey and they needed to give Hades some edge, the book already featured a good villain for this, Ares, the god of war, who appears as a gruff, violent biker. He's removed completely from the story, which took away the one scene I thought they couldn't possibly screw up. That big climactic battle which Riordan wrote with a lot of propulsive action and suspense. I couldn't believe that they left this out entirely, and apparently the author was in the exact same boat. In those emails to the studio, he says, Honestly, this is the best, most cinematic scene in the book. It's a crime to exclude it from the movie, and Ares is the best adult role in the story. At least they replaced it with a different climactic battle. I'm sure that one's just as good, right? Well, I guess this is the part where I should talk about Luke. I don't even understand how they managed to make this storyline so boring and obvious. Look, the twist in the book wasn't exactly unexpected for me, like I saw it coming from a mile away, though I'm sure many of the kids who read it didn't. 
but I at least understood why Percy and the gang would have never suspected him. They looked up to Luke, he's a few years older and seemed like a cool, laid back guy. That makes a lot of sense when the characters are 12, and that element is gone in the movie. And it's not helped by the fact that Luke only ever comes off as smarmy and annoying here. When Percy first arrives at the camp in the novel, Luke is someone he aspires to be like. He seems to know everything about hand-to-hand -hand combat, and he always has his back. You really believe he's someone that Percy considers a close friend and mentor. That's never the case here. They also remove one of the most interesting scenes from the whole novel. I thought Luke's backstory that he was given this like tossed off quest from his father Hermes and won nothing but a scar and pity for all his troubles was really well written. I could understand why he would align with Kronos. He's a guy who did everything he was told his whole life he needed to do to be taken seriously in the eyes of Hermes and the gods, and his reward was basically being a glorified summer camp counselor. His bitterness made sense, and that frustration is mirrored in Percy's own mixed feelings about his father. He also basically defeats Percy at the end, gets him poisoned, and manages to escape. Which is a pretty far cry from what happens in the film, where he's defeated in like 5 minutes. Oh, and Kronos also gets no mention here, which is a little weird considering I assume he's like the villain of the series. I'm known as Chiron. Centaurs are fantastic creatures with the head and torso of a human and the body of a horse. In my Narnia video, I talked about how they took the whimsical, episodic structure of Voyage of the Dawn Treader and turned it into a by-the-numbers video game fetch quest. Well, guess what they do here? They take a whimsical, episodic structure and turn it into a by-the-numbers video game fetch quest. And there was no reason for this. Look at a much better movie, like the Coen Brothers' Oh Brother Where Art Thou, which is loosely based on the Odyssey. That features three characters on a quest to reunite with the main character's family while encountering all sorts of odd situations and problems along the way. They all kind of feel like separate vignettes, but they really add up to give the viewer this feeling of having been on a real journey with these characters. Percy Jackson kind of did this too, and there's so many fun characters and monsters that the movie just drops. They leave out Krusty's Waterbed Palace, one of the most weird, interesting, and fun chapters of the entire book. I mean, I guess you could make the argument that these aren't 100% necessary for the plot, but then the plot is kind of all you're left with. The Lightning Thief is not a cerebral book. It's one where a character's growth is shown through their actions. Whether it's Grover learning to be brave in the face of danger against Medusa, or Percy going from someone who really underestimates his own intelligence to someone who can outwit ancient monsters. When you take most of that stuff away, you're left with a threadbare story with barely any meat on the bone. And that's what we got. But is there anything here that I liked better than the book? Well, I did like Joe Pantoliano as Gabe, Percy's stepfather. That aspect of the book was probably my least favorite just because he was such a one-dimensional character. He is here, don't get me wrong, but the guy is just a great actor and is really good at playing slimy morons, so he at least elevates the role a bit. He doesn't even get to be turned into stone and sold as an art piece though, so that was kind of a letdown. And Piers Brosnan was fine as Chiron, I guess, though the effects aren't doing him many favors. Sean Bean and Uma Thurman are purely here to collect a paycheck, but Sean Bean as Zeus is a really fun idea that I kinda wish was in any other movie but this one. In the end, this is probably a worse adaptation than Aragon. That movie just felt like the filmmakers didn't care about its source material. With this one, it kind of feels like Chris Columbus actively hates it. It doesn't help that the movie is shot and lit so, so boringly. Lighting these fantastical scenes like he was shooting a sitcom makes the effects look worse, and the boring editing choices causes the battles to seem limp and lack any impact. Like, don't get me wrong, he was a boring director in those first two Potter movies, but at least there he had really great production design and amazing sets to bail him out. This movie looks like the most expensive version of a Disney Channel original. Apparently, there's a Disney Plus show on the way. Hopefully it manages to do at least some justice to a book that's a lot more fun than this film ever was. So when I decided to create this video, having zero experience with Percy Jackson, there was one place I knew I needed to start, Audible. 
I went to the app and used my free monthly credit to download the book, and in less than a minute, I was already listening. If you're looking to revisit the series, it's a great way to do it. Or if you want a more adult spin on Greek mythology, I cannot recommend The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller enough. It's one of my favorite novels of the past decade, and Chiron even plays a major role in it. But novels are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Audible whether it's fiction, comedies, biographies, podcasts, or more. The amount of value you get from this subscription is pretty ridiculous, and I've been taking advantage of all of it, like access to the Plus catalog, which goes far beyond audiobooks and features great audio content in all sorts of formats. It's a great deal, and I can easily download them and listen to them whether my phone is online or not. So to get the Song of Achilles free right now and much more, go to audible.com slash midnight or text midnight to 500 500. That's audible.com slash midnight or text midnight to 500 500. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started. Because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.